consensus changes, but you know, if you come out with a change to the transaction system that's, that's really well tested, um, that's thoroughly reviewed, and that is clearly useful, then yes, you know, I don't see any barrier to kind of adopting those kinds of changes. So there are a lot of experiments with altcoins that are happening. Um, most of them, not all that interesting. Most of them experiment with the economics. I would like to see more experiments in kind of the transaction. <laughs> Wallets, um, absolutely. This year, I, I, this year is going to be the, the year for the multi-signature wallet. So in the previous panel talked a lot about the risk of losing your Bitcoins. We have the technology to make it much more secure to keep your Bitcoins. And we will see that technology come out this year. We will see much more secure wallets. I would say, you know, be careful. I would, I'd advise you to talk to a lawyer if you're actually holding money for other people. Then you know, talk to a lawyer and make sure you understand what you're getting into. Maybe even you know, talk to some lawyers who are familiar with banking laws, and definitely learn from past mistakes. There have been Insta Wallet was mentioned in the last panel, which failed miserably. Uh, you know, great product, pretty big failure. Um, so. You know, we need to move past the you know one guy in his basement decides that he can write a wallet application that holds tens of millions of dollars for people. That's, that's not the right way to do it. And then network. This is one place where I haven't seen innovation, where I'd really like to see more innovation. So you know, we have this peer-to-peer -peer network that's surprisingly reliable, um, but could be better. And I would really like to see more kind of innovation on the you know, how transactions and blocks are propagated, you know, what the network topology is, um, and all of that kind of stuff. I would really like to, to see more, more, more research, more innovation there. And that, that's, that's pretty easy. You know, you can have one network, we can have our existing Bitcoin network that sends blocks and transactions and running you know, side by side. Another network technology that is also, and you just have bridges in between so that transactions and walks are transmitted across both networks. And I think in the spirit of diversity, you know, that would uh, keep me from <coughs> staying up at night worrying about some bug in our network code that brings the whole thing crashing down. I'm pretty sure it's, there aren't any, but it would be nice if there, were, uh, there was more than one kind of network technology that we built on. So what am I worried about right now? <laughs> I'm worried about transaction fees, actually. I've been working on what I call smart fees. So right now, the, the, the tra transaction fees you pay for Bitcoin transactions are hard-coded by us core developers. We don't like that. We don't like making decisions. We'd rather not make decisions whenever we can avoid making decisions. So I've, I've actually been working on code so that transaction fees or a neutral market, so that if there are more transactions on the network, they take longer to confirm in blocks, and the transaction fees will rise, which will tend to naturally um, decrease the number of transactions, because the transactions are more expensive than we get to Europe. Um, there are a couple technical details I'm going to skip over. Um, optimizing how blocks are broadcast. This is very related to the problem with transaction fees, because miners right now have an incentive to make blocks that are fairly small because blocks that are smaller that include fewer transactions propagate across the network faster. And if you're a miner, you want your block to be seen by as much of the network as quickly as possible. Um, because as soon as your block is seen, everybody starts building on your block as opposed to some other block. So you know, there's work to be done to, to optimize the way blocks are broadcast. And I think there there's even might be some interesting research here on kind of what are the theoretical limits of how quickly can we you know, give enough information to the network so that they can start doing useful work um, as quickly as possible. Um, and there might be some interesting uh, bandwidth and CPU trade-offs. So I'd actually like to see more research done on that. I mean, in the very short term, we'll probably in the best we can. Um, and then finally, eventually we're going to run into this hard-coded one megabyte block limit. So each, each block 
the Bitcoin network can be at most one megabyte big. And increasing that limit is a hard forking change, probably, unless we do it in a pretty ugly way. Um, so this is, this is actually a, a, a consensus change that I know is going to be really hard and that I'm really not looking forward to and that I've probably been procrastinating about talking about for at least six months because I know how hard it's going to be. Um, but it's going to have to be done and we're going to have to find a way to talk about it productively. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of where my head is at right now and, and what my big worry is. <coughs> and I should say, you know, even if we don't solve this problem, then Bitcoin does become a reserve currency. <coughs> so, you know, it's possible that it won't get solved. Transaction fees will just continue to rise and only large transactions will be cleared across the Bitcoin network. And I personally don't want to see that. I don't think that's the vision of Bitcoin. I think the vision is this permissionless system where anybody can connect to the network and transact. Um, so I'm going to be working really hard on, on you know, trying to make sure that we, we can get there safely and uh, and with consensus. So that's all I have to say. I hope I have lots of time for questions. So I'm, I'm very interested in the question of information propagation delay in the network. And um, <clears throat> Christian Decker et al. have done some pretty interesting research. I know you mentioned them. Uh, they were considering splitting the inf and the difficulty check with propagating transactions. Um, <clears throat> but I also was curious what you thought about raising the default node connectivity from, let's say, 8 to 40. I know that increases the bandwidth requirements for running a full node. Do you think that's viable uh, and a reasonable solution? My solution to increasing the propagation of well, transactions. The, the default right now is 128. Uh, so you see eight a lot because that's how many outgoing you make. But each node will accept up to 100. I think it's 125. 125. Actually. 125. Sorry, off um, by three. So. Yeah, I, I don't think that's an issue. I mean, we haven't seen any, any it, it, it was an issue before we added uh, universal plug and play turned on by default. We were running out of kind of inbound slots because people had to actually tweak their routers. Right. Um, but once we, you know, put that switch and made it automatically do the evil, nasty, universal plug and play thing, that hasn't been an issue. Just one more question, Yeah, I'll be testing right when I back. Hi, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I know you talked a little bit about how uh, you feel some of the players in the Bitcoin ecosystem are under-investing in the core development, some of the companies, and so I wonder if you just talk a little bit more about sort of how you see which parts of the ecosystem should be stepping up and what amounts to fund the type of work that you guys are doing. Um, I mean, that's hard, because, and, and I think the, the, you know, the, the big profitable players in the ecosystem are interested in supporting it. Um, what I, you know, my default answer is join the foundation and and you know have a, a higher level of membership. And you, if you're using the core code, then you know make sure your developers actually contribute back patches. Make sure that they you know, participate in the. The full process, you know, give them some time to actually help review code, uh, to watch the changes that are being made. Um, so I don't know. I think you were at the point where it's a whole bunch of startups, and having done startups for you know much of my career, I understand how hard it is for a startup to focus on anything besides getting that first product out the door and then making sure that product is working and scaling up. So, yeah, it's it's a hard problem. It's a messy process. Um, I, don't, I don't have any magic answers. Okay, let me ask a question myself, if I could. Uh, you mentioned before your experience with VRML standardization and how that has informed your work on Bitcoin. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, VRML actually became an international standard. So I went through the whole, I, I was the, the chief architect of the VRML spec. 
I, I, I wrote most of the VMRAL specification for doing 3D graphics on the web. And if you notice, there's not a whole lot of 3D graphics on the web right now. Uh, so while I'm proud of that work, and while it was interesting to take it through the whole, you know, international standards organization, bureaucratic, fly to Fargo, North Carolina, and sit in a room for two days with people who were interested in 3D graphic standards on the web, I don't think that's the right path. I think you have to really start with useful applications. You have to do the experimentation. You have to figure out what works and what doesn't. I mean, if I were to do VRML again, it'd probably look like Minecraft, right? Um, which is very different from you know the way we did it. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit about a bit more of a technical question. Uh, you mentioned a bit about sort of the uh, systemic bugs that could cause a few problems. And recently, uh, in the IRC chat, uh, I saw Greg Maxwell, and I think before that, Peter Todd mentioned a specific bug about uh, signature hash returning one, and had it returned zero, anyone could have stolen anyone else's bitcoins, um, and you know the game would be over and all of that. I'm just sort of curious, what would the hypothetical response be um, in that instance? Would it be sort of a hard fork uh, and sort of a scramble to uh, outlaw that after a certain block number, or what, what would you do in that case? Well, it's, it's little known that in the early days of Bitcoin, actually not too long after I joined the project, we had a bug that would let anybody spend anybody else's Bitcoin. Um, and back then, you know, Satoshi was God. And Satoshi declared, everybody run this new code, I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> and if you look at the commit message, it was very cagey. And, and you know, I think Satoshi and I and the guy who found the bug and reported it responsibly, kind of the three of us knew why, um, but nobody else did. And you know, we're past that now. Um, if that kind of bug did happen, uh, yeah, you'd see a hard fork you know, very quickly. I think you would see kind of all transactions stop. We would fork the network, we would come out with new code, tell everybody run this code, you know, any transactions past this point, a do-over. Um, and then we would continue and you know the price would take a huge hit. Bitcoin faith in Bitcoin would take a huge dive. Uh, it would probably survive. Um, but it would be really, really bad. <laughs> so you know, I think that is what would happen. I mean, and the risk of that kind of bug is, is you know, why I still tell people Bitcoin's an experiment and don't invest your life savings. People always ignore me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that, that is really true. And, you know, I encourage people to still think of Bitcoin as, you know, early, bleeding edge technology. I think it'll still be, you know, another couple years, maybe once we have three or four or five, you know, robust re-implementations um, then I'll be more confident you know, telling people this is something that where 99.999% confident you know, won't have some horrible bug that we manage to miss. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the miners nowadays they don't have incentive to incorporate more transactions into the block because they want the block to trans uh, transmit faster over the network. Uh, so on the other hand, they can get more transaction fees if they include more blocks. So are you suggesting that the transaction fees today are not enough to um, make up for the um, cost of slower uh, transaction, of slower propagation time? And also, what effect does this uh, have on you know, how long it takes for a transaction to be verified in the network? Because we know every block gets generated on average uh, about 10 minutes, um, but does, does it take more than one effort right now for a transaction to be verified? Um. So, I mean, the answer for the, for the first part of the question for fees is, is yes. I mean, the, the block subsidy of 25 bitcoins vastly overwhelms the transaction fees that miners get for a block. So with the subsidy being so high right now, there's very little incentive for miners to include transactions with fees. In the long run, when that subsidy goes to zero, there will be an equilibrium where if a transaction has enough fees, it, yeah, it'll make the block a little bit larger and make it a little, tiny little bit less likely that it'll get orphaned, uh, excuse me, slightly more likely that it will get orphaned, that it won't be the winning block. And then you'll lose all the fees that you gathered up in the block. So I, there is an interesting 
a dynamic that will eventually happen. I mean, right now, today, the problem is that 25 Bitcoin reward just overwhelms the fee. Um, the second part of the question about transactions confirming, um, yeah, actually, the work I've been do doing on, on smart fees um, is showing me that you know average transaction confirmation time, if you use the, the hard-coded fees, are on the order of three or four blocks right now. So even if you pay the default, whatever it is, 0.1 millibit uh, per kilobyte transaction fee, transactions are starting to kind of pile up. And until some you know, nice miner decides to solve a large block and kind of sweep up all those uh, transactions and fees, um, it doesn't get confirmed. I'm wondering if you could speak to a couple of the points that you brought up. Uh, I think specifically relating to 